Okay, well, good morning to you all. Um, thank you very much for joining our forum. And it's uh, it's fantastic to see you all in our 14th week of our forum here today. So thank you all very much for joining. Um, my name's Paul Middleton. I'm a Managing Director in Protivity here in the UK. I'm joined by my colleagues from Protivity as well as my colleagues from our sister company, Robert Half. As many of you know, this is our collaboration forum, a forum for all of us to collaborate and learn from each other. We started this 14 weeks ago by collaborating around the disruption caused by COVID and how we remain resilient. But over the last few weeks, our focus has shifted and we've talked a lot more about how we begin to approach the future. And in particular, we've been discussing how we have to reimagine our businesses before we leap back into whatever business as normal is. And it's that future focus that you have told us is most important to you now and therefore the focus that we'll, we'll continue with today and, and going forward. But our, our aim remains consistent. We hope that by hearing the forum's insights, innovations and perspectives, you will join the dots to your own challenges, which will help with your decision making and give you greater confidence to make the right decisions and make them quickly. Last week, it was fantastic to see how many of the perspectives shared by our panelists really resonated with you. We heard from the CFOs of Dixon Carphone and Asahi, as well as from a communications and reputation management expert from Instinctive around how, how we should be managing both our personal and our business brands at this time. This week, we've changed the format slightly um, and we've deliberately chosen a smaller, more focused panel um, to allow you more time to dig into the perspectives that we hear from them. And we're delighted to welcome back John Ashcroft, um, a statistician and writer of the Saturday Economist, to give us some of his data fueled predictions about where we are in the cycle and what's coming next. And a lot of you will uh, remember John from previous sessions, as well as by Professor Jürgen Meyer, uh, UK industrialist, government, ad government and business advisor. And we're delighted that uh, both of our distinguished panelists can join us today. As normal, we're also joined by Leila Tyndall, who's a managing director from Robert Half Executive Search, as well as by Protivity's global head of digital and innovation, Jonathan Wyatt. And Jonathan will, will be adding a Protivity innovation perspective to the insights we hear as we go through. So for those of you who are free and wish to stay on at the end, we'll keep the conference bridge open again, as a lot of you like that, just so we can, con we, we can continue a more informal discussion um, and you can meet other attendees. Um, but for those of you new to the forum today, and in case you don't know us well, Protivity is a change management consultancy and we focus on technology risk, internal audit risk and, and change management. We specialise in managing the risks in your businesses, changing your business and helping you face the future with confidence. And in collaboration with our parent company, Robert Half, we have a wide audience here today on the forum, including clients, friends and partners from many industries such as financial services, charity, manufacturing, food, public sector, retail, technology, hospitality, media and many more. So before we kick off, a little bit as normal on forum logistics. Um, as ever, this is this is your forum and we have over 120 people here today, um, which is fantastic to see. So please ask your questions, disagree, agree with the panelists, give your points of view, collaborate, but please in interact and make it as meaningful as possible for you. You can ask those questions in a number of ways. Firstly, for those of you um, who are, who, are uh, who've you, who use Teams a lot, you can see that you can raise your hand by pressing one of the icons. So I suggest if you wish to ask a question directly to one of our panelists, please just press that icon and I'll, I'll make sure I come to you. As many of you prefer, however, you can write your question in the sidebar. So please do that. Um, you can do that by just hovering over the, the chat, um, the conversation icon and just and just write your questions into the into the bar on the right hand side. A number of you often dial in on the phone. Um, from time to time, I will mute everyone just to minimize background noise. If you do, if you are on the phone, you may need to press star six to unmute yourselves. So without further delay, um, we'll go as normal to our two minute recruitment barometer. As a number of you have looked to the recruitment market to understand which industries are recovering um, and which sectors are recovering. So uh, once again, I'd like to introduce Leila Tyndall, who's a managing director in our Robert Half Executive Search Division. Leila, if you could just give us your, your normal two minute overview on some of the statistics and trends that you've seen over the last week, please, on the global recruitment stage that can shine a light as to how different geographies and industries are recovering. Please. 
Sure, thank you, Paul, and good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Great, great to see so many people uh, continuing to dial in. So I'd like to mention this week, start open by uh, mentioning the Office of National Statistics. Uh, some figures have just been released. Um, just looking at employment and unemployment rates. Uh, so February to figure, sorry, February to April figures show weakening uh, unemployment rates with male employees and self-employed seeing reductions. Uh, the reduction in total hours worked is a record both on the year and the quarter, quite half the period being covered prior to the implementation of coronavirus measures. So the UK employment rate was estimated at 76.4 percent, 0.3 percentage points higher than a year earlier, but 1.1 percent percentage points down on the previous quarter. The UK unemployment rate was estimated at 3.9%. 0.1% higher than a year earlier, but largely unchanged compared with the previous quarter. I'm sure John will cover this a bit more, but UK economic inactivity was estimated at 20.5%. So for us at Robert Half this week, uh, what have we seen globally? So job flow has slowed and is flat week on week. Uh, last week, the last two weeks, I've reported some quite uh, um, serious, significant fluctuations in our in the temporary side of our business, um, with a spike happening at the beginning of June with a 73% increase that particular week and a drop last week. Uh, but this week, again, it's picking up for us now um, with a 30% increase on job flow on the temporary side week on week. In Europe, job flow is up 16%. Asia-Pacific is up 22% and the US is up 13%. So I think what we're seeing is a stability. Uh, some of the top sectors remain consistent. FMCG, manufacturing, packaging, logistics, supply chain, healthcare, pharma and professional services, which also covers IT and technology services. Um, that is also being discussed by investors this week. So investors have come out and started to talk about liquidity in the market, something we'll hear a bit more about from uh, London Stock Exchange next week. Um, one of our speakers, Bod Buckby, will be talking about that next week. So uh, whilst job flow is static, what we have seen at Robert Half International this week is a huge increase in confidence in talking to business leaders as that most businesses are now in the recovery and reimagination phases. Uh, we are starting to have some conversations um, about hiring needs uh, as, as businesses confidently start to look at the future. Uh, so I think the next six months will be an interesting time as we start to see shift. Uh, and redeployment of people with the furlough scheme changing over the next few months. That's it from me. Lady, Thanks thank you so much for that. So I'd like to introduce properly our two panelists today. Um, firstly, to welcome back John Ashcroft. Uh, John, as many as you, many of you will remember from previous weeks, specialises in economics, strategy and financial markets. He works with professional firms, large corporates and SMEs. He writes The Saturday Economist, uh, his weekly blog, blog published on a website of the same name um, on the UK and world economy that I know a number of you here subscribe to. Um, John specializes in viral modeling and is this combination of modeling, economics and financial markets that have resonated with so many of you over the last few weeks um, and why we thought that today on week 14 of, of lockdown, it would be great to hear an update from John again. So we're very pleased to welcome John back. Um, secondly, I'm delighted to introduce Jürgen Meyer um, and welcome Jürgen to our forum. A number of you may recognize Jürgen as the former CEO of Siemens UK, where he worked for 33 years. Um, since retiring from Siemens, Jürgen has directed his time towards providing leadership, encouragement, critique and thought leadership for UK's policies and activities aimed at creating greater prosperity and to level up our northern regions. In doing that, he's been a regular contributor on television programmes such as Sky News, as well as a regular panellist on BBC Question Time. Um, Jürgen, is co sorry, Jürgen is chair of Digital Catapult, co-chair of National Made Smarter Manufacturing Programme, a board member of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership, as well as an advisor to the government as, as part of the Industrial Strategy Council. 
And as you'll hear today, Jürgen is a passionate advocate of strong leadership, innovation, technology, and how our industrial strategy should form a greater part of our UK PLC prosperity engine. So at a time when we're having to make decisions around how we reimagine our businesses um, and how we recover, we thought that Jürgen's perspectives would be fascinating and powerful for us all to hear today. So thank you both for joining us. As normal, we're also joined by Jonathan Wyatt, who is Global Head of Paturity Digital and Innovation based in the UK. Jonathan's been at Paturity for over 15 years and specialises in helping organisations manage the opportunities and risks presented by disruptive innovation. Jonathan will be commenting on how we should approach innovation as we remobilise our businesses today. So thank you all for joining us once again. So John, if I may turn to you first of all, sir. Um, with the death rate almost double the level the UK government called a, a good result a few weeks ago, where are we, do you think, in the pandemic cycle? Uh, what is the pattern of recovery? And is the impact of the economy going to be better or worse than you than you previously told us? Well, there are three good questions to start the morning session. Um, I think that uh, first dealing, dealing with the pandemic cycle, it's pretty clear in the UK we're at the back end of that particular wave. We talked about a 90 day episode. What we saw in China and in Singapore initially was a very confined, tight 90 day episode for the viral infection. And that was pretty typical of what we would expect. But then what we experienced in Europe was a much sort of wider, like a long, fat right hand tail where the, the process reaches its peak. And in the UK, for example, it's estimated the peak was reached in, in the beginning of April with something like 2 million cases, uh, infections, according to the research at Guy's. But in the Europe, we saw the same peak and then a much longer, fatter right hand tail as the cases dragged on for whatever reason. And there have been many speculative reasons about why that has happened uh, in the months and years to come, because there's so much data for the research to work on. So for the UK, we were talking about the way of drawing to its conclusion towards the end of the April and into May and the all clear sending lockdown being lifted in May and the all clear signal being sounded in June. And I think in general, the all clear sirens are sounding, but many people just aren't hearing it yet because there's still a lot of nervousness uh, in government about the relaxation of the final level. So, yeah, we've been through the worst. We've seen the peak. We're at the back end and seeing a sort of you know, moderate number of cases now, a thousand cases yesterday, a couple of hundred deaths, always a tragedy, but we've seen the peak in the deaths. So it is now time to think about, and the argument between the scientists about lockdown and the argument from Treasury about how we get out of this mess that we're now in is becoming more acute and Treasury are having the stronger voices. What we said right at the start is, if you apply these medieval measures of quarantine and containment to a contemporary economy, then the medieval measures will push us all back into the dark ages. And what we have seen in the shock to output in Q2 is a drop of output of the order of over 20%. The ONS figures for April suggest a drop was 24% year on year. These are staggering numbers that we've never experienced ever before. And from there, we say, yeah, your, your first question about the viral wave, we're through the peak, the all clear sirens are sounding, it really is time to get the kids back in school and attack the measures that will get the economy moving back towards normality. So your second question is, where are we in terms of the UK economy? And I think now it's pretty clear, we can see exactly now where we are. When we first saw, the furlough scheme in place and saw which industries, which sectors were being affected, you could pretty then produce a sort of model of where the impact was going to be across the economy. So the Bank of England were talking about a 35% drop in output in Q2. The um, NISA, would, no, OBI were talking about 35%. The Bank of England were talking about 32%. NISA were down at 32%. But our numbers came up around 21, 21 22% for the current quarter. And I think that's going to be pretty near the mark because ONS say at 24% in April, we've seen now construction being lifted, a return to work taking place. So 20% drop in Q2 looks to pretty much on the cards. And what we have seen by sector is we saw manufacturing drop by 30%. We've seen construction drop by uh, 40%, a big drop in the service sector. And of course, the hotel and leisure sector, travel and tourism being near annihilated in the current level. So where do we go from here? Well, again, we can say that the recovery will be very swift, it'll be V-shaped, and it'll be very positive. 
So it follows that logically, as industries return back to work, even in Manchester, outside my door, there are more construction workers back on the sites. More industries are opening up. Now the, the retail sector opening up. So as you expect these sectors to return to some semblance of normality towards the end of the year, so too we'll see the mitigation of the depth of setback in the economy. It's still going to be big. There'll be something like a 12% drop, let's say, in Q3, and a 10% drop in Q4. And for the year as a whole, the consensus at the moment is the output in the UK will drop by 9%. We model it at 10 But that means that next year, once you get into Q1, you're leveling up against the, the growth year on year. And by the time you get to Q2 2021, then, of course, you've got such a dismal performance in the current quarter that's going to give spectacular growth numbers for Q2. So, yeah, a 10% drop in output this year, a 10% growth potentially next year. And it's the same pattern that's been modelled in for America and also for Europe. Finally, what does that mean for jobs? Well, Leila hinted on some of the issues. The April figures were masking the underlying problem in the economy because Rishi Sunak is now the most popular member in cabinet. Why? Because he's employing, he's on the payroll, he's payrolling, bankrolling over 10 million people in the UK, nearly 9 million on the furlough scheme, a brilliant manoeuvre by Treasury to defend jobs. And in addition, there are sort of 1.5 million, 1.3 million that account uh, unemployed. So Rishi Sunak is under pressure because this furlough scheme is going to cost more than the NHS if it rumbles on. He's under pressure to actually mitigate the cost. So today, for whatever reason, he's talking about triple lock pensions. Why on earth he's talking about that today, I don't know. But nevertheless, they're under pressure to mitigate, to get people back to work, to get people back to normality. And they're, they're threatening to eliminate the furlough scheme by the end of November. Will they do that? Well, probably not. Because in hotel and leisure and uh, travel and tourism, those industries are going to need more support for much longer. So what is the policy call now? Just to finally wrap up, there are two issues the government has to address. One is social distancing. We cannot go back to normality with two means of social distancing in place. And the argument rages <clears throat> between the scientists and the behavioral economists and the actual economists. But for industries like uh, restaurant trade, for industries like um, tourism, it's very difficult to have normality with two meters social distancing. And the argument is very weak, especially when the World Health Organization recommendation is just one meter. And the second issue that has to be addressed is the quarantine period for travel and transport. Because if you want to see any sort of semblance of growth for tourism and get those big spenders back into Oxford Street, then the quarantine period has got to be ended as well. So I think, yeah, we know exactly where we are now in terms of the epidemic in the UK and the pandemic worldwide. We know exactly where we are in the economic cycle and the way and path out of it. The measures that have to be addressed relate to social distancing and quarantining, but nevertheless, we are going to get back to normality. There will be a moderate recovery, a swift, it will be a V-shaped recovery. There are always V-shaped recoveries. It's the mechanics of how we get back to work. So yeah, we know exactly where we are in the pandemic, we know exactly where in the cycle, and we know what has to be done by government now to make the changes to get things back to normality. Thank you, John. Um, fascinating insight as ever, and it's uh, it stirred up some thoughts already in the in the chat coming through. And you can you can probably see there that some, there's some comments around um, you know, whether, whether the government is playing politics with this as a, as opposed to focusing on the science. And I'll come back to that a little in a little bit. I'd like to focus this first on um, a question just coming through around the 20% um, shrinkage in our economy. Um, and a reflection that really our economy has been brought to a, a complete standstill. So is that number a surprise? Is that number actually a good outcome for us, do you think? Well, I think it, it, we can't say it's a surprise because we've had no, we, there's no way we have experienced this kind of thing. I don't think Treasury, even when they were talking about the, the shutdown and the lockdown <clears throat> put in place, that when that came into place, the Treasury was taken aback when they introduced the furlough scheme and so many people signed up. So. It's a good thing that well, it is where we are. And I think that, you know, certain industries, as I say, so when you look at the list, that sell retail down by about 30 odd percent, construction down 40 percent. When you do the sectoral analysis, it's pretty clear where the damage has been. So I think that in manufacturing, for example, there are parts of the manufacturing sector which are gangbusters. If you're in food, if you're in certain PPE equipment, if you're in rent-a-kill, if you're in supplying pesticides, that sort of thing, 
they're, they're working hand at 24 seven trying to get back at the output to meet demand. And yet, obviously, in the car industry, then the car industry has been decimated with registrations down by 95. I mean, 4,000 new cars registered in April, a big rally in May when they went up to 8,000 cars. This is absurd. So you get this disparity across the UK manufacturing in all these different sectors. <clears throat> but 20, I mean, I said 24%. So yeah, we say 22% in Q2. That's devastating. We've never seen that anything like before. But it's how we get out of it now. Here's where we are. We've got to get out of it. <laughs> And you spoke, John, previously about a V-shaped um, recovery, a, a, a rapid recovery as we come out of that. Again, just picking up on some of the questions there, do you think that is going to be V or is it going to be U or is it going to be some other quirky shape? What's your, it's what's a your v. view? It's a V. There are always Vs. If you go back to the post, uh, when we've had data since 1948, there are always a V-shaped recovery. It's the mechanics of recovery. So you never, you, you, because, and this time it's even more positive, because that it will be a V. So I think that you go, as industries return to work, naturally their output picks up. And we're talking now about GDP output-based measurement of the economy. So as, as more sectors go back to work, whether it's retail, <clears throat> whether it's the restaurant trade, whether it's the, the, the hotels, as these sectors go back to work, output will pick up and it will be a V. And if you think about it logically, by the time to get, you get to Q2 next year, there has to be something like a 20% uplift because the comparison this quarter is so poor. It's like having a replay against Arsenal for Man City. You know, it won't be <laughs> with that reversal from last night. But, the, you know, so it will be a V. It's always a V. Forget all that U and alphabetic, alphabet suit that people like to talk about. It's a V. It's always a V. Okay. It always has been. All right, John. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a, there's a lot more questions coming through, and I will come to those. I'm very keen to bring Jürgen in. Um, Jürgen... Do you do you agree with the picture that's John that John has painted? And I mean, in your mind, how should we best be rebuilding a prosperous economy during the second half of 2020 and into 2021? Yeah, great to uh, to be here, and uh, um, nice to nice to meet you all, and uh, and and brilliant to be on a panel again with you, John. And uh, and I always love your optimism. It's absolutely brilliant. And by heck, we need we need plenty of optimism right now, don't we? Um, I, I I I nearly agree with John. Um, I'd say there's a there's a that's slight not, difference. That's not bad, is it? That's, that's not, well, no, that that isn't bad. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll we'll get onto some areas where we probably have a slightly different view in a moment. But uh, you know, I, I mean, clearly. Uh, there is going to be a uh, um, a rebound in in some sectors of the economy, um, but but I think what will happen is that it will it will start as a V and then it will flatten. So the so the sort of the right hand side of the V will will go up quite fast and then it will struggle for probably quite some time. And I'm not sure what letter there is to describe that. And the reason why I say that is because there will be some sectors and uh, John you've already mentioned one of them automotive but another one um, even more significant one is aerospace which uh, you know which is quite large in the UK and has big supply chains where there really is going to be some very significant structural reform um, and uh, and therefore they're going to struggle to to bounce back. And actually, what's going to have to happen is we're going to have to find some new sectors and some new economy activities, um, which take up the slack for the sectors which are going to struggle. And and as we know, building new economy activity, um, especially that to replace a sort of high innovation. Uh, type industries um, does take uh, take some time, um, so uh, so yeah, I think it'll be slightly slower in terms of recovery. Um, in terms of um, your your question as to what we should be doing, um, you know, I think we're going to have to accept uh, that short term this is going to be pretty difficult, um, especially for high tech manufacturing businesses in sectors like uh, like aerospace um, so at the same time to have a you know a really really uh, good strategy for creating the industries of the future in other words this is the time if there's ever been a time this is the one to create a strategic 
industrial strategy. Um, and what that means is it means that we do have to get over our free market ideology. This is where me and John will 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 probably have disagreement. Um, although I think in these times it's difficult to argue um, that uh, free market ideology has gone, um, because for the next decade, um, governments all over the world are going to intervene in markets more so than they have ever done before. You know, they already have. And in the UK, we have to do the same. And given that we are going to be pouring billions and billions into the economy, my argument is it would be pretty stupid to put that in without putting a proper strategy behind it and making sure um, that we build the industries that we really want. So I think what we need is we need um, some real strategic partnerships between the private sector and government defining um, what some of those sectors are. Um, that does mean we have to pick some sectors that we think are going to win through to, to replace the sorts of jobs that we currently have in aerospace. Um, and there are some obvious sectors. Um, offshore wind, um, I mean, that's one that many were skeptical on when I was party to creating the British offshore wind revolution. Um, lots of people on the right wing of the Conservatives were totally against that, didn't support it. And, uh, and we've created an amazing industry, creating cheap electricity and most importantly, creating thousands of jobs in the Humber and up the uh, northeast of the UK. And I think we need to invest even more in that. I think we should be investing massively in the hydrogen economy. I think the UK has a real opportunity to be a global leader uh, in that. Um, and, uh, and I think there is a real opportunity for the UK to be a strong leader in electric aviation as well. So uh, hybrid aircraft uh, technology, um, there's a lot of good things. And by um, being leaders, what we have to do as a nation is to massively invest in the research and development of these much more than we are currently doing. Um, that means strong government uh, uh, intervention. Um, and then the final thing. Uh, I would say is we need to put in stronger supply chain uh, support uh, because um, the other distortion we will have as we recover from this industry is that the companies that will do okay and better will will very often be the larger companies. It will be people like my old employer Siemens um, that will do quite well because they have invested well in some of these areas that I'm talking about in terms of R&D. Um, the sectors that will do less well will be the small to medium sized companies uh, sitting in the supply chains needing to um, change from being in the supply chain of automotive and aero and trying to get into these new sectors. Um, they won't have invested as well in uh, digital and innovation technologies over the last decade. So programs need to be put in place to support those businesses to better invest in those. And that, by the way, is what Made Smarter is all about. That is a, uh, a government intervention, a government support program in partnership with the private sector that helps and supports small to medium sized technology companies invest better in innovation and digital technologies so that they can, uh, uh, well, they can improve their productivities, but also they can shift uh, to the uh, to the more prosperous uh, uh, industries. So, uh, yeah, leave that one there for now. Thank you, Paul. Jürgen, thank you very much for that. Um, and thank you all for your questions coming through. I will I'll, I will do my best to um, take them all to, to John and Jürgen. If I could just pick on one theme that uh, came up early on, um, uh, and I'd say alluding to a degree of uh, political cynicism around um, what we see here. I mean, it's the government, the government might know what it needs to do, um, but is it actually, does it have the appetite to do what it needs to do? So, Jürgen, you've spoken a number of industries there, aerospace being one that's been in the press, um, requiring dramatic rescue packages. We've seen you know, this week decisions over free school meals. Is there is there the political will um, or are we, or is the political, or are we playing political games with some of this as well? John, what it, what's your view around that? On the... On, on the will... The will to really invest within into the UK economy to to make it as prosperous as possible, or do we still see some political game playing around it? Well, first of all, let me just say in response to Jürgen that uh, you know I, I confess to having two biases. One is a, a sort of um, optimism bias, which uh, influences all my work, 
And that's why I think I had something like half a million hits on LinkedIn over the last couple of months because I, I was offering these positive themes on recovery. I think one, one of my favorite posts was some, one of my readers said, even my mum started reading your posts because they're so optimistic <laughs> and so positive. So I confess to an optimism bias. And secondly, I also confess to a contrarian bias because I was brought up to challenge everything. And that doesn't include you, Jürgen, today, because I don't see why we have any basis for disagreement whatsoever. I would argue that two things, really. One is much more greater emphasis on the digital infrastructure and the development of the rapid development of 5G. 5G. And the second thing is a big investment in infrastructure. So I think with sort of 5G in terms of the digital overload and the physical infrastructure requirements for road rail, uh, addressing the issues of the northern powers and also flood defences and uh, uh, which is essential for the UK. So I would add those two things into my agenda. But going back to government attitude, I think at the moment, you know, there's a real problem in government because the sort of torn between one side and t'other, between the scientists and the economists on what, how to get out of this this issue over the epidemic, what is happening with the, the schools, the opening of schools that are going to open, no, they're not going to open. Now, today, 1,600 uh, paediatricians are coming out saying get them back in school because there's more damage being out of school. There are too many conflicts in government about what is happening with uh, social distancing. They exhausted a lot of political capital with Dominic Cummings and they're so terrified of making the mistake, lifting the barriers too soon and being guilty of having a second wave. There's no concept of a second wave at the moment. There are 8 million cases around the world, 400,000 deaths. We're still in the middle worldwide of the pandemic. So we're still in the midst of a middle way, but they're so terrified about making those decisions. Then, then of course, you've got the issue of, dare I say it, because I think the four things, what business is gonna face, there are four challenges as they come out of this. One is the implications of COVID. All that stuff about social distancing, travel, leisure, personal protective equipment, COVID, how we get out of the COVID mentality. The second thing is the normal recovery from any recession unemployment, spending, investment, housing. The third thing is we're seeing is the ongoing challenge of digital disruption because there's been a precipitate acceleration of retail online, especially in food online. There's been acceleration of the elimination of cash in society, the cashless society. So a lot of these issues that businesses face are, have been jolted in like flexible working, agile working, working from home. These issues have been given a jolt so there'll be a significant jolt in online food retail. There'll be a significant jolt in, in work life patterns and concepts there. So these issues of DD, digital disruption, they're just being accelerated. They were there before, now they're being accelerated. And the final point is, even if we addressed all those things, and it goes back to government is, you still have the issue of Boris and Brexit and Trump and tariffs. And in many businesses I talk to, many big industries are talking to, and there's a warning government, there'll be no recovery. Jürgen mentioned aerospace, we're worried about aerospace, we're worried about motor, and we're worried about textiles and marine. These are the industries which are really threatened if we get disruption with Europe. So I think those industries are warning that even if we get through the COVID thing, even if we get through the return to normality, we still have the issue of what the hell is happening with Europe. So yeah, as per the, and, and the government is ready to throw money at anything at the moment. So you got the, the reversal on school meals through the summer. But there's an, I never get any concept that there's any perspective on timeline, no real time thinking about the timeline, about where we go for the year after this and the year after next. And what we need is that national infrastructure plan and the actual forward thinking in terms of uh, 5G coverage and the transport system. And that is not there. There's no perspective. There's no thought process in government at the moment. And that's a real concern. And that issue between left and right within the party, between the Europeans and the non-Europeans, and so on, that remains a big issue. So I think, yeah, I am concerned. So th thank you, John. We'll come back to Brexit, I'm sure, a little bit later on as well. But Jürgen, if I could just ask you to just reflect on some of those government will points as well, please. That would be interested there. Yeah, um, well, what a crisis does. A crisis means that John and myself agree on these issues. I mean, that's quite, that's quite, that's quite amazing. And, uh, and, and by the way, John, I do always read your, uh, your, your blog because it does fill me with optimism. And, and, and you're, you're, you're so right. We, we, we need that. And, uh, you know, we shouldn't talk everything down because there are lots of long term opportunities here. Um, and, and, and staying on the optimism, I mean, is there a government will to level up? Um, and to create more prosperity in the North. I mean, 100% yes. 
Um, there, there, there is no question about that. You know, does Boris Johnson uh, believe that we need to level up? Um, I, I believe he 100% does. Um, the, the issue is, is, is how we, we can deliver on it. Um, and there, um, we do have some problems. Um, I mean, I think we will get there, but we will get there somewhat slower than many of the European, uh, of our European competitors and also slower than the USA and China. And the reason why I say that is because I see three problems. Uh, the first is, is we don't have the best experience in the UK politically um, on how to, and how to create a long-term strategic industrial strategy. Um, because we haven't done it for 40 years. Um, you know, for 40 years, we've had various half-baked approaches. I've named one example that has worked particularly well, which is, uh, which is offshore wind. But generally, we have a sort of a, you know, we have a, oh, let's pilot something. Let's, let's have a go at something approach, um, rather than going in it and fully embracing it, like we did with offshore wind. And experiences is, is that you can only really embrace some of these new sectors um, you know, like um, uh, offshore wind I, I've mentioned, but whether it's hi the hydrogen economy, if you really throw scale at it, because that's the only way you'll become world beating. So it's not let's do a, a hundred million pilot in research, it's let's put a billion in uh, to, uh, to really make that happen. I mean, the good news is, is, you know, there is an appetite, as John has said, for billions at the moment because we're, we're feeling bold in terms of the recovery. So, but we're not experienced at it. So we do need to build, um, you know, a real attitude of, uh, of creating a long-term industrial strategy. Um, the second thing, exactly as John has said, is, you know, I'm fascinated how we are stuck in, in, in sort of almost electioneering slogan you know, ultra short termism. I mean, it's not even short term as in for this parliament cycle. I mean, it's short term this week. Um, and, uh, and, and I think the government just needs to sort of, you know, shake itself off and say, we have won an election with an 80 majority. We don't need to be electioneering every day. Um, you know, we can, we can actually embrace um, industry um, and create a long-term, a long-term approach and long-term strategy here. Um, but at the moment, you know, there is none of that showing at the, at all. Um, and uh, you know, I, it's obviously the the pandemic that is doing that. But at some point, very soon, you know, they do have to shake themselves off and uh, and start partnering with industry to create a long-term approach. And then the third reason why I think there is a challenge, and this one will be really interesting, and that is that you know. Whilst I do think there is political will, there is this right wing within the Conservative Party, which is, of course, the same people who have been promoting Brexit, the same people who very often are climate change uh, doubters, and the same people who absolutely are the free marketeers. And those people will continue to, to, to push against um, what I'm saying. So the question will be, is, you know, will, will Boris... Um, and, uh, and and the you know the people who are more in favour of levelling up will they be able to punch through um, to keep those doubters and those sceptics away to do the more sensible thing and to create the sort of industrial strategy that I'm talking about? And if we don't do that, we won't level up. Jürgen, thank you for that. There is, I'd like to move on in a moment to looking at um, some of the green agenda as well as comparing ourselves to where what we see other, happening in other countries. And John, I know you can speak to that. But Jürgen, if I may just ask you a question I see coming through in the chat. And as I say, um, John's reflected briefly on Brexit, but given the likelihood of a no deal exit from the EU, how will this impact in your mind, Jürgen, our ability to recover from COVID? Well, I mean, there's no question about it. Um, it, it is going to be extremely unhelpful. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I mean, let's be clear, you know, I, I'm, I, you know, I got over the fact that we're leaving the EU quite a long time ago. Um, and, uh, and, and whilst I don't agree with it at all, we are leaving. Um, what I don't understand is why we're now inflicting this pain on ourselves, you know, at such pace. Um, and, uh, and certainly for the sector that I represent, which is manufacturing and engineering and technology, um, 
it is going to be very, very unhelpful to put the non-tariff barriers, you know, and everybody talks about tariffs and things. To me, those are never the real issue. The issue are the non-tariff barriers and the disruptions to supply chains that you create in industries like automotive, uh, aerospace, offshore wind, actually. Uh, so that's going to be that's going to be very, very uh, unhelpful. Um, and there is one other piece that, that people don't hear about very much or, or hear, don't hear enough about on Brexit. Um, and that is actually, it could be an inhibitor to research partnerships too. Um, and none uh, of the things that I've talked about, which is, you know, entering um, the hydrogen economy uh, and uh, uh, entering the um, the electric aviation area. There is no country in the world that can do that on their own. Um, you can lead, uh, but you generally need to do it in collaboration. And our very good collaborators on a research end on these technologies have largely been European countries. And the UK has been able to participate in European research programs. Um, people on the uh, call will probably be aware of the Horizon 2020 program. And unless we find a way to continue to participate in those sorts of research programs, um, it is going to disadvantage Britain because what will happen is companies like Siemens, but many other countries, they will decide to do their research in Europe instead of doing it in the UK. And uh, for those of you uh, in technology business, you know generally where you do your research and innovation is where you end up scaling your manufacturing and creating the jobs. So, so it's going to be unhelpful. Um, uh, and I just damn well hope that uh, it's not no deal. Uh, and in the end, that sense prevails and we get a deal that is a decent deal and is a deal that allows for uh, some alignment on standards and, uh, and regulation and keeps us relatively close. Jürgen, thank, thank you very much for that. Um, we'll definitely come back to that topic in a moment, particularly looking at the need for innovation then, I think, to address some of those gaps in terms of how the government is going to be moving there. But John, one of the points that's resonated previously with our attendees has been that view into Asia in particular, looking east. And what, what can we learn from where they are in their cycle? And, you know, what should we be there for kind of expecting and what, what can we leverage from their experiences so far? Well, of course, uh, Asia was first in with China and Korea into, first into the pandemic. and Logically, therefore, they came first out. So they had a shock to open in China was something like 6% down in the first quarter. But since then, the, the lockdown in Wuhan and Huawei province has been released. And we're seeing signs of growth in manufacturing now in terms of retail spending. So the reason the suggestions that they could China could have positive growth in the year overall with the strength of recovery. So moderate numbers of one or two percent, but they're in and they're out. And despite all the noise and excitement in the press about the, the cases yesterday or last couple of days in Beijing, <clears throat> those are just minor outbreaks as they've happened in Korea and also in Singapore. So China is going to lead the way out of this, pulling that Southeast Asian bloc. And I think uh, what we tend to underestimate in the UK is the significance of the Southeast Asian trading bloc now and the China powerhouse that is the powerhouse. So really all that noise and trumpery and frumpery that we see in the White House is really, it's almost echoes of a lost empire because the real emphasis now is what is happening with China in Southeast Asia along the, the sort of Silk Road, the spending they're doing in Africa, the money they're spending around the world, that they're going to be the significant powerhouse for the future. And this appalling, I think it's a, the significant addition to go to war with, with China over the over 5G, and, and it, it just seems quite, quite illogical to me. And these talk about, and also I think, just digressing for a moment, taking the high moral ground on Hong Kong. When we got Hong Kong, because we went to war twice with China, because they weren't buying enough opium from Afghanistan and and, uh, and the empire. So all this moral high ground in Hong Kong is, is to put one side. So why on earth we're trying to alienate China, I don't know, because they are going to lead the way out of this recovery. And heaven knows, only about five months to go to the election in November, Trump already 14 points behind in the polls. Hmm. Well, you know, we'll see what happens there. But yeah, China is leading the way. And I think that uh, that's going to be very significant for everyone. I just going back to the point, um, Jürgen was making though about uh, the, the Brexit deal 
and alignment. The critical thing is alignment. To suggest we're going to leave the EU is one thing. And to suggest we won't have any alignment on product is really suicidal because industries like uh, pharma, big pharma, pharmaceutical and chemical, they're faced with enormous product costs of maintaining products in the UK. It becomes uneconomic for our big pharmaceutical companies to actually maintain the product catalogue in the UK because they have to separate a regulation and alignment. And there'll be, you'll see a rationalisation of something like 80% products lost in the sense that they cannot compete if there's no alignment. So it's quite illogical. The whole issue is quite illogical. And when you get um, Gove saying there'll be no extension, when you get Patel saying there'll be no alignment, this is really alarming. Mm. No, John, thank you so much for that. You agree with Jürgen again, actually. Sorry, I'll, I'll find the agree with Jürgen on this one. Well, Jürgen, just turning back to yourself, then, Jonathan, I know you had a question around innovation. I think you want, in, and given some of the questions and themes in the sidebar we've seen around the speed of action needed, and the diversity of thought needed, do you want to just bring us some of those and sum those up towards Jürgen? Yeah, no, I, I think um, thanks, thanks, Paul. Um, I, the the immediate reaction I guess I've had, and, and it's been great just sitting back and listening to the conversation rather than actually having to intervene here. But the but but um, but there's been a lot of talk about the need for government intervention and the government and the role the government needs to play. But but then there's probably been a sense of realism that that may well not come at the pace that we want it to come or that we need it to come. Um, what does that actually mean and leave to business? In, in the context of business leaders and what they need to be doing. I think, I guess my link to, there's been talk about the need to take risk. Um, government's not very good at taking risk and therefore does industry need to, to pick up and take some of those risks around research, development, driving innovation. Um, innovation leaders tend to be, have much higher risk appetites, tend to take risk. Um, and, and therefore, how do we embrace some of that digital and innovation culture within some of these organisations that might not be responding it? Or is that the wrong direction to go? So interested in your perspectives as to what do businesses do if we if we take a view, whether it's accurate or not, that um, the government does not react quickly and, and therefore the onus is left on business leaders to, to drive the change we need to see. Yeah, no, very good question. And, uh, and, and, and you are so right. I mean, we often do you know, throw the ball over to say, look, it's all about government support. And I don't really like the word intervention. It's sort of government support. Um, but the truth is, it's got to be a partnership. Um, you know, and this will only work if the, the private sector work in real harmony with the government on creating this industrial strategy uh, and working on it in a long term way. Um, and, you know, and what business has to bring to the party, I think, is crystal clear. And the writing has been on the wall for the last two decades, by the way. Um, it's just this pandemic has just made it crystal clear. Uh, and the first thing is, is, you know, whatever your business in, make sure you've got a strategy to decarbonize. Uh, because you know the the main intervention, the main support that's going to happen is going to be for businesses that are prepared to decarbonise or be involved in activities. So, if you're a service industry, I would focus your activities on looking at those industries that are in lower carbon or moving to lower carbon sectors. Uh, the second thing is invest in uh, digital technology or if you're in the service industry you know be like you, you, like you are um, you know you you you're in the right space which is help companies to uh, to invest in digital tech and 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 how to improve productivities how to uh, uh, to be able to export more in uh, in the in the in the last than that the third is to invest in skills much more so than uh, than we have done ever before, because the biggest challenge we have on skills is the upskilling of our existing workforce. We always talk about schools and universities and colleges, which is very important. But actually, I see the bigger challenge, the people in work and how do we change those to become more digital, to work in some of the new economies that we're, uh, we're talking about. And then the final point I would say is, um, you know, be um, inclusive and be socially responsible. Um, you know, don't wait for the policies that are going to force you um, to be looking uh, more and more uh, at, um, you know, socially responsible, at inclusive uh, behaviours, women on boards, BAME uh, people uh, on boards, all those sorts of things are going to come much more to the fore in terms of policy. Um, and the reason is, is, is because that's what 
democracy is shouting for and calling for. Um, so, you know, I say get ahead of the game, because if you do, you know, you will be uh, you will be a well regarded uh, uh, business. Yeah. And, and, and Jürgen, I guess my, my, my quick reaction to one of your comments, and I talk a lot about digital transformation, what actually is a digital transformation, and I think people jump at new emerging technology, whereas for me it's much more about changing the way an organisation acts and thinks, and it starts with people, it starts with culture, it starts with skills. If you try and lead with the, the technology, you do tend to end up with um, an expensive old organization, whereas if you change the organization and the way it thinks, you end up with a um, an organization that can embrace the change and the opportunities and understands where it wants to go with vision and direction. But but you need to lead with people and, and absolutely support your comments. So. Jonathan, thank you for that. Um, John, it's great to see that you stirred up a, an, an absolute hornet's nest on Hong Kong. So um, I'm going to leave that alone for the moment. But um, Jürgen, I'd like to just ask if you can just build on some of those comments um, you just made. Just and and particularly, let's focus on the green agenda for for a, for a moment. To what extent do you think that green agenda is going to be top of companies' agendas as we come out of COVID? Because there is a potential conflict between short short term shareholder expectations. Um, and the need to invest and drive some of those green agenda items. What are your what are your thoughts around that? Well, I think this is one where actually the momentum had already built to such a level, both in terms of societal pressure, but also in terms of actually political. I mean, this is one area where. Um, you know, with the exception of like, you know, the very right um, uh, of our politics, there is political uh, consensus on this. Uh, so therefore, you know, everybody is talking about a green recovery, um, which means that the largest amount of government support is going to go into into greening uh, our economy and and that in itself will change business behaviors because if you're wanting to make bids for grants for research if you're wanting uh, 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 to get uh, uh, you know um, upskilling support more of it is going to be available if you're greening your business those sorts of incentives are going to be there I mean my view is is you know if you're a business person don't wait for those incentives you should be doing it because it's the obvious thing to do it's the right thing to do it is what Britain is going to do despite the skeptics. Um, so, so this is something I'm actually very optimistic about. And I think we're on a journey to greening our economy. And I think it will create a better economy, a more prosperous economy, and it will create many jobs. And we've proven it with, uh, with, with offshore wind. That's the good news um, that we've got a test case and we know it can be done. And Jürgen, I think while a lot of people would agree with that, just reflecting on one point made in the chat that you talk about incentives and support for that, and you know we can we can expect that. But where 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 are the funds for that going to come from? The government was, in some people's minds, on its on its knees before COVID, and, and now it's going to be having having funded a large part of the UK for some time on its back. Where are we going to find the funds to do this? Um, well, I'll leave that one to John. He's the economist. Uh, but, but uh, you know, I mean, but actually it is a really interesting debate and I would be interested to, to hear John's views on it. Um, but there is there is pretty strong consensus that the worst thing we could do coming out of this is to go into a period of austerity. I mean, that would be the natural reaction if you were coming out of any sort of normal recession. But this is not a normal recession. And therefore, I think I'm afraid we are going to have to come out of it very bold um, and, uh, and borrowing even more. So the answer to your question is, I'm afraid it's taking on even more uh, debt. But the good news is, is, is that with low interest rates, with the way the economy is behaving, what we're learning is, is that, you know, actually in this sort of a climate, whilst demand is dampened, um, actually um, you can take on that sort of debt without the normal risks uh, of uh, of spiraling uh, uh, inflation, uh, so so it is going to have to be a time for uh, for investing for the super long term, um, and it seems that uh, uh, recent economic theories are supporting that that is possible. So I don't know whether this is one we're going to agree on uh, too, uh, John. I'd be interested in your view. <laughs> well, as you know, I have a contrarian bias, and this time I have to say, I'm going to agree with you again. 
No. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think that uh, you know now is the time to think about a hundred billion plus of infrastructure bonds or with a with a carbon green fifty billion surplus, if you like, because. You can borrow money at uh, you know 20 basis points at the moment for 10 year gills. And we they talk about modern monetary theory, that if you have a sovereign government with its own currency, then you can be more defensive or aggressive in terms of your borrowing capacity. OK, MMT also stands for the magic money tree. And there are we, we, we talk about this element of uh, dire straits economics because the government has this option of money for nothing, gills for free. And it's called quantitative easing. Because under QE, the Treasury rack up the debt. They commission the Debt Management Office to issue the gilts. The Bank of England obligingly buy the gilts, underwritten by Treasury. And then the coupons on the gilts are returned to Treasury because the Treasury is their money anyway. So why not? Now is the time to issue those 100 billion plus infrastructure bonds with a green kicker on the side and borrow for 10, 20, 30 years. And then we can see the real benefits of the economy because this is fundamental investment money. At the end of the day, people say, how are we going to pay it back? We won't even have to pay it back because it's an asset for the Bank of England. It's a liability for the Treasury. And one day in the long distant future, like old soldiers, the debt will just fade away and two sides of the balance sheet will be reconciled and the debt will disappear. But the infrastructure will stay in place for decades to come. How about that, Jürgen? Very good, John. Fantastic. Very good. Fantastic. So, um, <laughs> Some very powerful store, um, statements there, and I think it's, it's been fascinating to hear the debate. What I'd like, so we have a number of business leaders on this call. Um, what I'd like just to end with, Jürgen, is, and, and John as well, um, what's your call to action in simple terms, your three, your three asks for the business leaders we have on this call at this time to help us on this journey for recovery? To you, Jürgen. Yeah, well, I think I think I've already said them, uh, you know, so the first is, um, you know, engage in uh, in, in the future uh, economy um, and by that show leadership both nationally uh, and engage in whatever way you can in helping create the strategies for those new industries, the green economies that we're going to create. The second is, is invest in your own businesses. Um, particularly uh, uh, in technology, to uh, to make your businesses more productive, more competitive, and uh, and and greener. Uh, and the the final one, and it's crucially important, and we often miss it, is invest in your people capital um, and uh, and in the skills of your people uh, in order to, uh, to to manage the transition from uh, from from the you know today's economy to uh, to the new economy that we're going to build over the next twenty or thirty years. And at which point we will write off the debt. I love that, John. That's brilliant. So, <laughs> but, uh, Jürgen, thank you ever so much for that. John, your your closing thoughts on our on the on your top tips for the UK business leaders at this time. Well, I, I, I think the, the the key challenge at the moment, the top tip is understand is survival. Is to understand the perspectives on survival because that's what we need to do to get us through this current crisis and out of the pit that we're in at the moment. So the priorities on survival and the cash issues. The second one comes back to the people argument that this is transition to, you know, the business I talk to now, they're talking about the development of empathetic leadership. The, the era of the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion has gone out the window. So the era of the hippo is gone. It's about inclusive workforce, relationship with the workforce. And also it's got to be more empathetic, a lot of emphasis on work-life balance and on mental health and these issues of mental health in the workforce. So it's understanding survival offerings that survival to your workforce and then making sure the engagement pattern for the workforce, because not everybody's going to come through this, but we've got to be clear that we're offering that route forward. So my horizon is unfortunately rather short term in terms of the business needs at the moment. But those issues that uh, Jürgen correctly addresses, you know, things like the green agenda, the people agenda, the location challenge, flexible working and so on, and this work-life balance, they're so quite important as well. Fantastic. John, Jürgen, thank you ever so much. Some really fascinating perspectives this morning, some wonderful debates. It stirred up a lot of uh, thoughts and questions from our, from our attendees, which is exactly what we hope for. So thank you ever so much for that. Um, this isn't quite the end. As, as we roll to the top of the hour, um, we will be keeping the line open um, for those of you who wish to join us afterwards for more informal discussion and networking, um, what we call the after party or have done in previous weeks. So please join us for that if you have the time. 
Our next forum is next week, uh, next Thursday, when we'll be hearing from Serco, um, who are helping with the, um, with the government's test and taste test and trace program, as well as from the London Stock Exchange on how the markets are performing and what the future holds for the markets. So once again, I'd like to thank our panelists today. Um, thank you all for joining as well, our attendees. Um, thank you for your questions. A, a, a fantastic range of questions coming through, which has really driven the debate. My apologies if, we haven't, if I haven't managed to get to all of them, but, but hopefully I've got to most of them. Um, and if we haven't, very happy to continue, con to continue the debate offline. Um, sincerely hope the forum has been useful for you and you can apply some of what you've heard from John, from Jürgen, from Jonathan today um, to your own businesses. Um, and so on behalf of Prativity and my Robert Half team, I'd like to extend our best wishes to you all. Stay safe, be kind to each other, um, and we look forward to meeting up with you all again soon. Thank you all very much. Okay, thank you, Paul. Bye. Thank you, Matt. And thanks yeah. to you, Jürgen. We'll yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great discussion. Good to see you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. John and Jürgen, I thought you were very well behaved. That was excellent. <laughs> so thank you all very much for uh, for staying on. Um, it's very good to see you all. I'm sorry, my. Le Leila, can you hear me all right? Am I, am I on mute? I can yeah, hear you. Okay, yeah. okay, perfect. You're showing, you. you're showing mute on the no, screen, one. but you, you're coming through. It's fine. Okay, perfect. Um, so I can... Now you're muted. Try unmuting. That's better. No. No, it's not. <laughs> No, it's not better. I'm wondering if we're having some uh, connectivity issues as people are leaving. I think you're back again, Paul, now. If you're used to on my screen. No, you're not. No, no, the, the new button's coming in game. But anyway, technology yeah. letting us down. Um, it is, actually. Can you see, Jonathan, how many participants we still have remaining for the after party? Yeah, we are on about, we've got about 20 or so people still, still on. So, um, yeah. OK. Um, is there anybody who would like to raise a particular question on some of the subjects that came up? Yeah. I think we have a I, I say for me there was there was a, there was a lot of interesting conversation and dialogue um, in the, um, the that came up particularly around um, and we, we started to touch on it. We were conscious there was still an awful lot of interest and questions going on that um, we mm. um, we we didn't get to. So 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 kept it brief and to the point. But I, but I do think there was quite a specific focus around reskilling, upskilling, the need to upskill teams to change the way organisations think and. Uh, yeah. And and I and I do think there's very significant challenge and opportunity for organizations in in doing that. Um, mm -hmm. I do think from from my experience from a digital and innovation background and working with organizations, um, yes, most organizations have got some very capable digital skills within the organization, but 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 actually when you look across the workforce as a whole, you you do tend to see relatively low levels of digital literacy across across the workforce. And, mm. and I do think organisations turning their attention to that is going to be a key priority for, for organisations in the um, in, in in the weeks, weeks and months ahead. Um, if we're going to embrace this, remain relevant, I think the digital channels will remain strong. Um, one of my questions I was going to come back with, which I didn't get the opportunity to, just given where the dialogue was flowing, was almost a reference. If we're coming out of a, it's going to be a V recovery, we're going to get back to normal quickly and we need to get back to normal. Um, I think the conversation on an awful lot of our previous conversations is that normal is not going to be the same normal it was when we left. Um, mm. And 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 therefore, uh, maybe we're not going to get back to normal. We're just going to get back to a new reality and, and our economy, economy is going to recover. But but mm. 
but but I think with that, organisations have got to have a strategy and a plan to adapt and evolve. And um, and if they um, don't have that strategy, um, I don't think uh, much so, Leila, you might like it, a recruitment strategy as being the answer to reskilling. Um, I think the reality is... No, I don't, I don't think that part. is. No, I don't think that's Definitely. right. I think I think it's got to be part of an accommodation. And certainly uh, to your point about technology, what we've seen and certainly over the last few weeks is is quite a lot of reactive recruitment, which is an immediate need, which ties in with the short term uh, horizons that people have been working to, which is, you know, I think over the last few weeks, I've, I've reported that we've had we've had high demand in our tech line of business for social media IT support, uh, that is a reactive type of surge in demand uh, from people with the move to working to home, with organisations needing to uh, bolster, despite a cash uh, shortage, to bolster their uh, voice uh, digitally through digital channels and uh, their offering to moving to online if they don't already have that offering. So I think we have seen that and I think we will continue to see more of that. But I think that, you know, already if you look at the you know the, the sectors that um, John referenced that are, are pretty decimated, you know, 90% down, uh, travel, tourism, leisure, already those employees have already moved over to other sectors. So we will see a lot of uh, de redeployment of people between uh, sectors in different demographics and geographical areas and pay, pay brackets. Uh, we're already seeing that. Uh, and um, I think we'll also have to see companies addressing upskilling quickly um, in combination with recruitment at different levels. Um, for and, and it's going to vary. Uh, there will be real disparities within sectors and again you know with other sectors some sectors are flourishing and when we broaden when we look at the umbrella of manufacturing it's consumer manufacturing that's flourishing and heavy manufacturing and industrial manufacturing that's suffering yes indeed i saw that as well ask, yeah yeah th th thank you very much indeed paul i think one of the one of the comments that came out and i think it was through yourself jonathan um was the um what the impact of digital uh, transformation um, on a business, and particularly on an old business, um, and it's, you, you see a lot of a lot of vacancies for digital transformation people tend to be IT technical roles. I'm seeing, um, but the reality of it, it's it's a, as I see it, it's a it's a very significant change requirement for a business to go through digital transformation, um, and I think you made the comment about. Putting digital transformation on an old business just adds cost, um, and it, I appreciate your perhaps yourself, Lila, and, and certainly yourself, Jonathan, because I know you're you're close to this. How you see that developing over the next few months in terms of opportunities, but also for the business to actually recognise that. Yeah, so we, from a digital perspective, so absolutely, we we agree with the the sentiment of the comment, and I I think the but uh, but I don't actually believe it means that an old business can't transform, but it needs a very deliberate and conscious and focused effort yes. to transform. And and it needs a recognition and understanding, which came back to my, I guess, my opening comment, that digital transformation is not about technology. It, it is about um, preparing the business Culture. to be relevant in the digital age and in the digital economy. And it's not quite the same thing. Um, they tend to come together, but it, but it isn't actually about, oh, we've got to start using robots instead of people to do something, or we've got to start, we've got to have a strategy for what we're going to do with AI. It's actually about thinking about what is our organizational role and position and, and how do we react and respond to that. We talk a lot about organizations going through stages of digital maturity. So we have skeptics at one end um, um, and everybody is, it recognizes now the importance of technology. And it's not to say a skeptic isn't embracing in digital technologies, but we talk about those as being ones who in general are doing it because they have to, rather than because they see it actually as a mechanism and an opportunity to, to differentiate, to lead and to drive. You work your way through them through beginners, through what we refer to as followers. Um, and the beginners tend to be doing digital things, but with no coherent vision and strategy and direction as to where they're going. The next stage people tend to get to is they know where they want to get to and often actually at that point have a realization they've got even further to go than they thought they had because they actually have got a much clearer understanding through to the advanced organizations that are really hyper scalable 
technology driven, highly automated, um, embracing digital channels, which we talk about being the digital experts through to the, the leaders being the genuine industry disruptors. And you put all of that and it's a journey you need to go along. And there's a very balanced approach to that, including elements around strategy, organization, culture, um, the way you organize yourself. Um, there was a little bit of the hippo conversation in the dialogue today, but yeah. it's around removing hierarchy because um, typically you are, digital organizations are very, very flat organizations. Leaders sit in open plan. They sit right out in the office. It's a very different way of thinking and a mindset and culture that flows through the organization. And then that flows through to, um, yes, elements around how you drive innovation, um, how you reward HR strategies, how much of your focus on all recruitment is in assessing people's digital literacy, their views on the future economy, how they're going to bring the organization forward, how much of your promotions and internal decisions around who you're rewarding is actually focusing on the people that are the people who are going to drive the business into the future and making sure that they are being surfaced and valued and understood and identified. And I think some of those things are critical. Data and your ability to utilize data, the ability to use technology, the ability to hear the customer, are all critical as well, but but it is it is a combination of all those things. At least that's my my perspective. So yeah, yeah. John, I totally agree with that. And um, perhaps question question to Layla. Layla, are you seeing that uh, that 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 cycle coming through on the recruitment side? Certainly, the from my point of view, I I see recruitment from a digital transformation, and they tend to be IT technical roles as opposed to transformational roles. Yeah. I think we're um, that there's a few things in there. I, I completely agree with what Jonathan has said. The people agenda um, uh, really depends on the size and scale of the business. When we think of um, highly innovative digital businesses, uh, they are typically at the smaller end of the scale. They are moving very quickly. The demographic, you know, the average age of, uh, you know, we have a huge digital economy in the northwest. Uh, I think the average age of those companies, you know, ranges between 22 and 27. The leaders of those businesses are, are typically under 30. Uh, they have been working in the space already since they were 16. Lad Bible uh, has been recruiting people, you know, will recruit people uh, who are immersed in what they do and are generating content and have been making money online since they were 16 and all the way through university. Um, you know, the bloggers that my nine and 11 year old uh, listen to are only mid 20s and they've been going for 10 years or more. So it, these there's a, there's a quite a range in uh, experience. So when we talk about the setting the digital strategy, actually what we see, there's quite a disparity in in pay grades about when you're typically looking at a leader. Um, a leader you would expect to have a number of years experience of customer experience, digital innovation, you know, typically, you know, in their 40s, they've led teams. But actually, there is a little bit of a disparity. It's closing. The gap is closing. But when organisations at search level start looking for customer experience director or digital, you know, uh, digital uh, um, or marketing directors with a lot of digital growth, growth generated through that move uh, through technology, actually the results of individuals at a very senior board level versus the experience is quite different uh, because, you know, certainly for me, I grew up in the old school of marketing. Uh, we were getting catalogs through the post and, um, you know, there were phone calls. It's that kind of generation that are moving through. Uh, and what we've seen is uh, in some cases, um, some people with uh, and we can't really talk about age discrimination. So people with less years of experience, but a higher level of results and who are immersed in that space, going on to the boards as non-execs or advisors. So some of these old companies that we're talking about that need to go through some kind of change or transformation. Um, yeah, I, I think there needs to be a very deliberate uh, strategy. People do need to take time. I think Jonathan's right. You need to take time and think about what that does to an organization, how the customer will benefit as well as the people. And I think internal comms, I think communicating and training your people is a very important part of it. And in terms of recruitment, I think there's a lot of reactive recruitment at the moment. I think we'll start to see different roles coming through. Um, so, uh, but I think that it's, it's also, there's an element of, you know, recruiting, not recruiting in your own image and looking at different personality traits and biases. Yeah. 
And one one other thing I would just say, picking picking up on your your comments, is um, there's a very good paper actually that I I read a, a short while back from the Open University, but about training. Um, but one of the observations that it was drawing out is is training leaders and leadership, not training from the bottom. So we're all very good at building training plans and training curriculums for our junior people to upskill. Um, but then you tend to look at organisations and see that the senior people haven't done it, haven't taken the training, aren't upskilling, aren't training, they're relying on their experience. Yeah. And, and, and in this world, the world is fundamentally different and fundamentally changing. So you've got to look at the capabilities and skills of that leadership team. Yeah. One of the first yeah. boxes we look at is, and we, we do when we talk about digital maturity, we talk a lot in the terms of the context of organisational capability. Um, so when we talk about strategy, we don't actually focus on do you have a strategy? Anyone can go and buy a strategy. It's a, um, we actually we focus on the organisational capability to articulate a strategy and to set out a strategy. And where you're getting that input from and support from doesn't necessarily matter. It can be from advisors. It can be non-execs. You can go through your board and actually give everybody a digital shadow who they listen to um, as long as they are genuinely listening to those people and hearing those people and hearing those perspectives and points of view. The other bit that I think is very important in here, and I touched on this briefly in the conversation as well, is risk and risk appetite. Digital leaders are big risk takers, traditional organisations, and um, look at risk management as being risk avoidance. Um, and we talk a lot about risk management as being risk avoidance. If you actually look at most enterprise risk management programs, they are all about quantifying the risks and coming up with risk mitigation strategies. Mitigation. The immediate <laughs> assumption is we avoid risk. Um, when you look at digital leaders, they are genuinely risk, generally risk takers. When you picture individuals that are in leadership positions in those really big organizations, the high profile ones, they're not. They're, they're all risk takers, whether it's Richard Branson flying um, hot air balloons around the world and people looking at him and thinking, what are you doing given where you are? And what? But they are risk takers in their private life. They're risk takers in their business life. They're all interested in the space program. They're all they are people who take risk and and therefore risk management needs to change in a lot of organizations with this. And and it needs to we, we talk a lot about trying to move to something that is much more about a risk distribution. So you saw risk leaders taking or digital leaders doing things much more like things like Monte Carlo simulations on risk distribution, around risk events and actually raising the question at times, are we not taking enough risk? And I, I, I posted a while back and it got some response and reaction around um, CROs. How many organizations have heard their CRO walk into a boardroom and say, I don't think we're taking enough risk as an organization at the moment, but they should and they need to. And, and I think part of the area we're talking about um, Jürgen, I think it was today rather than John, talked a bit about governments in the same point, needing to take risk, being cautious, dipping their so, toe in things. And, and digital leaders don't do that. We used to laugh and joke about Google and some of the investments they were making. What on earth are they doing? Another billion. They're never going to make any money. I, the quotes in the early 2000s around organisations like Google and Amazon and others are never, ever going to make any money. It's just um, um, just... Just um, I say, not obviously turned out to be a reality anyway. So, Jonathan, I can see on my screen, I can see this is probably unfair. I can see Paul, I can see Adam, and then a couple of other f people are flicking out. I don't know, Paul and Adam, if uh, if what Jonathan later said kind of resonates with yourselves. Um, I think you're both muted, but it's. Um, Apologies, I think generally, in terms of, in terms of risk, Sorry, Adam, it's very, it, it might just be my end. It's very difficult to hear you. Mm. Yeah, you might just have your teams. Up loud enough, I'm afraid. No, I can't hear you. Paul, Paul just while um, Adam's. Yeah, no, I, does, that, does that resonate with yourself? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can yes, hear yeah. you, Paul. Yeah. Super. Uh, no, I, 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 first of all, thank you. I found that this morning really interesting, um, really good uh, debate, first of all. And then, you know, subsequently this chat, I think that, yeah, absolutely. I think the, the, the risk point and the difference, I, uh, my, in my previous job, I was um, head of engineering at RAC, a very, you know, uh, traditional company. And I saw that a lot, the risk averse kind of, um, you know, 
between digital and traditional. Um, I, you know, I had, a, I had a quick question on um, the advent, you know, the, the mandated advent of working from home and what that kind of we think will mean to digital businesses. Um, I, I just, uh, you know, it, it's something that, that struck me over the last kind of couple of weeks that all of a sudden, yeah, and it goes, I think, a little to the um, uh, the empathetic leadership uh, question as well. Uh, what well, you know, the, the Jonathan was talking about uh, that all of a sudden people that have been asking to work from home from years for years have been, um, you know, told that they have to work from home and this, you know, democratic. Um, response that that might mean from the teams and kind of more of a, a social look at what that might mean. Uh, that's quite a large question, I, I understand, but I just wonder. That's got, cool. Can I that's suggest got your name, Jonathan, all over that? Um, well, we've also got Lisa. Are you happy to jump in on this as well? We've got Lisa Hooley on. Uh, I don't know if she's just um, Lisa. Are you happy to join in the conversation and answer that? I can see you're on, but you're on mute. Yeah, just unmuting. Um, uh, uh, hi. Um, yeah, so Lisa's actually a, a, a leader of, uh, has been a leader of many shared service centres and hundreds of people. I'll let her introduce her. She's a, a good person to help answer that that question as well, Paul. Fantastic. Yeah, so I'm happy, I'm happy to comment. I mean, from, from my perspective, um, I think it's really, really interesting. I, I have a uh, I have a view that comes from a, a leadership point of view and I have a view that comes from a, a, a an individual contributor point of view, I suppose. Um, and I guess my view from a leadership perspective is that, you know, there's there's different ways of looking at leadership and there's the fallibility and infallibility perspectives as well. And I think that actually we've um, created a lot of ego centric leadership that has wanted to be seen to make the right decisions in the right kind of way. And to hold the the, the reins and the, the purse over what happens in an organisation, and I'm really really interested to see what happens because you know the pandemic has, has really swept away all of that kind of egocentric thought process, and we've had to do things. And so as we come out of um, the pandemic, which of those kinds of decisions actually will be will be kept or swept aside? And will we revert to this egocentric, I'm at the top of the tree, I can make those decisions because I want to be able to put my finger on things or not? And actually, if we went back and looked at the value perspective from a leadership point of view, there's several people, including myself, for years have been lobbying for virtual setups, the lack of office space, because let's face it, it's the huge percentage of overhead when you're in a business where you're supposed to be reducing costs. And yet the position has really been from a leadership point of view generally in the industry, we need to be able to put our finger on those people because there's a lack of trust in, in, in these kinds of setups. So, again, when I look back at the situation and I think of all of the time that we've lost because the ego of leaders couldn't make decisions like this and then compare it to the situation we've just found ourselves in, actually, all of that's been swept aside. We've done it anyway, somewhat successfully, mostly successfully, I would say. Lots of lessons learned. What will happen now in terms of the credibility in that leadership space? Mm -hmm. So I, yeah. I think I think it's yeah. a really interesting one to reflect on, and I really do think it should reverberate in the halls of leadership. If I, if I had my way, <laughs> I, mean, I do think yeah. um, interestingly, it's I, I do think the the work from home debate. And I, I say I I I have been a work from so it hasn't doesn't feel like such a dramatic change because I I've done it a lot because I have a global virtual team and and, and so I've, I've I've worked from home a lot for long before. But um, but I've been very very aware of the battle and 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 I think it's one of those where people were very good at pointing out all the potential risks associated with people from working from home and sometimes it comes from a perspective but I don't think I'd be very good at working from home therefore I assume nobody else would be either um, and and I think it's part of what um, has happened in the recent times is people have been forced to do it and because mm. they've been forced to do it they've realised actually it worked quite well. And in some places, and I've heard many organisations saying, actually, we work better like this than we did before. Not not actually, it's not been that bad. It's actually been better. Yeah, we've, we've um, heard a lot of productivity going up, productivity yeah. going up. But I would I mean, say that's for some been... roles, some roles and some people. Some people are very keen to get back to work. I think there's, again, a generational um, and experiential. If your home is 
lovely and you have space, probably want to stay there. If it is less lovely, you live with uh, you have lived in shared accommodation, you're probably quite keen to get back. To work. <laughs> I, I found that, I found this discussion very very uh, interesting on the on the back of a, a, a digital transformation question, really, in the sense that uh, picking up on Jonathan's point, digital transformation is a is a whole um, roadmap of of transformation. And I think the term itself infers that it's a technical uh, uh, piece of work, you know, involving IT people. Um, and I think the discussion that's resulted from that question has just shown that it's it's far far greater than that. It's a, um, a and it and it raises a question about leadership. It raises the question about processes. It raises a question about um, how you go to market, um, and almost the um, um, the digital actual. Uh, application of it is is um, uh, is a product as opposed to the um, the actual you know the strategy itself, um, and I think it's great in terms of it, it it opens up opportunity for for many people on this call to to support businesses through this given given the the type of people we are, um, and um, I think that's that's a very big positive to come out of 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 this discussion certainly. Uh, it's Lisa again. I just wanted to add one point, if I can, because sure. I think it adds into this digital transformation um, consideration and debate, actually, um, because I think the positioning pre-pandemic for a lot of um, people based and organisation based decisions like this, if you're not forward thinking and in the, in the right mindset, had been a lot around how technology was disabling. So you had to be in the office because this system sat there on that computer. You had to be in the office because these printed printers printed out those things on a daily basis in this place. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the argumentation, whilst on the face of it, people are embracing digital change or so they say, the reality of the practical steps of what they were doing actually weren't displaying that culture whatsoever. So I think what the pandemic has forced us to do is to get off of the footing of um, the lip sync and actually to walk the talk of making digital transformation a reality so less reactive, although it was massively re reactive, and more proactive in terms of embracing what digital transformation and digital change really means. And I honestly think that's revolutionary for a lot of organisations that thought they were doing it, but actually just found out they weren't. Yeah, and we talk a lot about the digital veneer, and you'll see plenty of things that I've written in the past around the digital veneer that you see around organisations. So they sometimes, from the consumer side particularly, on the outside in, look as though they've gone through a complete digital transformation. You get behind that veneer and nothing's changed. Mm. And um, and you can hide it from your consumers. You can often ha harder to hide it from the partners. Um, the revolution has been slower on the, com on the B2B side, often because businesses don't demand change at the same pace because mm. they're not transforming so therefore they're willing to live and put up with an organization or a bank that is not transforming but I think as we've been forced down the digital agenda as they are forced to digitize then all of the businesses that support them are forced to go with them and you may well fun suddenly find that that b2b um, um, priority or the priority to transform for business that are serving in the B2B sort of capacity will increase rapidly now. And I and I do think it is a it is a period where people are going to have to um, in, embrace change fast. And and um, those that do that and want to do that, um, I think will succeed. Those that mm -hmm. resist it, I think their their time is limited. I, I did stand up at a conference a long time back and say, if this doesn't excite you, it's time to retire because it there's never been a more exciting time I think in terms of trying to steer and manage and drive a business through a period of, of significant change. Paul does that resonate with your own thoughts? Is it I mean there's a lot of stuff there I guess but is that does that broadly uh, resonate with your own thinking in this space? Absolutely um, I, I think that um, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how the the sort of work force if you like react to that uh, you know the the forced working from home thing where you know like, like i said before there was a lot of people that absolutely crying out for it and and the kind of the uh, I, i've worked in the past for quite a few ceos etc that that like to ask for everybody's um opinion on you know what we should be doing digitally and what we you know but then actually just come up with what they thought in the first place which is, I think, it's the worst thing in the world, right? If you yeah. don't want my 
you know, don't ask for it. You know, you always know what you want. Um, so I think that 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 once the anger sort of, you know, I've I've seen a lot in forums and stuff of of people being quite angry that you know now they that, that they like working from home, but it's only been the the COVID that's forced them to do it. And now that that kind of the, this distrust of the management that that, that Lisa talked about um, it is coming into the, the fore a little bit, and I think that's going to change the, the 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 democratic. You know, and I, I'm, my big thing has always been kind of contextualizations, uh, contextualization of, of decisions, as, you know, and and empathetic leadership, so that we can bring people along with us rather than just kind of tell people what they're doing. And I think that's really interesting. Um, you know, views on kind of to see what's going to happen in the future of, of this as we you know at the moment obviously you know everybody has to do that everybody you know but to see what those sort of old-fashioned more old-fashioned or you know the, the digital veneer companies have gone through whether they just revert back to doing what they yeah. did in the first place and just mm-hmm. think well mm-hmm. that was the coronavirus stuff let's just get on now or whether yes. that's you know, embrace that and uh, move forward. I think that's going to be a really interesting thing. I to agree see. with you. I, I, it is interesting, Paul, and I agree with you. And I think we are, we have got a bit of time on our hands. Let's not all forget we are at home. We're not traveling. We're not flying around the world. We're not jumping in our cars. We're not taking children to school. We're not going to shops. We're not doing leisure activities. We have got time on our hands to debate this. And actually what our colleagues have seen, um, particularly in China, is that it's largely business as usual, businesses have gone back to normal, people are on public transport, uh, people have gone back to offices, uh, cafes and restaurants are open, people are buying their sandwiches for lunch, um, and businesses are very keen to recover to make up uh, for the severity of you know, uh, the financial losses over this period. Um, so I think you're right, there w- it will be interesting. I think a lot of trust has been gained, but at the same time, we've had employees at home with nowhere to go uh, and wanting to you know, pull together. There's been a real sense of pulling together to get us through this um so it will be interesting to see if i think some habits will remain but yeah it will be uh, and it will be very dependent on uh leadership we talk a lot uh, in search about how you know the leaders cast a shadow i know lisa this will resonate with lisa uh, but leaders absolutely cast a shadow uh, on their organization of course uh so yes but i think there'll be a, a striking a balance between leaders wanting to get cash back in <laughs> to yeah. the banks uh, and trying to uh, retain some of what's good but um yeah i know uh, we I think bring this to a close because I, I think we're running out of time here but the the couple of other quick cop thoughts i have just just wrapping up i think the the comment is forced work from home i think in many cases it will be um more forced work from anywhere now at the moment that is home because of the current environment and yeah. whereas if it's work from anywhere it feels very different there'll be an interesting question it's come up in our household around um schooling and what do we do with schooling and do we actually move to a virtual school with now uh, the, um, the the concept of actually us doing the teaching not a good answer but 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 moving mm-hmm. to but moving to um, mm-hmm. online teaching and virtual teachers and other options that are out there and available giving you freedom and flexibility to genuinely work from anywhere and actually i i fan i fancy two weeks um doing my work from the swiss alps where we could go skiing in the evenings or whatever it might be and 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 it being a mindset and school obviously removes a lot of those freedoms and options that are there but i think i think there's an element of that the other comment i just equally have there's obviously the introvert extrovert cultural question around whether people like the work from home or not i i've never done the research i think a lot of digital organizations a lot of technologists probably default to being introverts versus extroverts um and it'd be interesting to know whether actually if you looked at the dynamic of uh of digital leaders whether you do see much more of an introvert culture than you might see in certain other industries and certain other businesses and whether that my my sense is that will have a significant impact on your strategy about where people work and how people work because um certain organizations will take to it very very comfortably and we and there's a very interesting dynamic difference between the staffing side of our business and productivity part of our business which is abnormally introvert for a consulting firm and it's and it has its strengths and its weaknesses but it's but but therefore (laughs) you'll see those sort of dynamics playing through in what what does and doesn't work within an organization yeah um 
Adam, thank you as well for putting those thoughts through. Um, in lieu of your uh, your microphone not working, I think I don't know, Jonathan, if you've seen those, and Paul, Paul and Lisa as well, just around Adam's points on culture, behaviours, process, tooling, training, and and so on. So I think absolutely yeah. they resonate, and I think it's the theme we've seen over the weeks, particularly where I don't know if you heard the the CEO of an insurance company describe how they're all very digital until someone walked into the foyer of their head office with a bag full of cash to pay for their insurance policy and one of their employees gratefully took it and he said well you know, <laughs> we're only as good as that weakest link in that sense in terms of being a you know a digital business but look, I mean it's a it's a fascinating discussion I think it will run and run um, we've got a we've got a I think another I think we're building on this next week as well so we've got we've got Serco London Stock Exchange and a few others before we're turning to some more of a sports agenda in in weeks after that as well so um but please if you have ideas and uh you wish us to focus on anything then then please let us know because this feedback and the things you're saying to us is always very useful in terms of how we look to calibrate what we what we cover and who we and who we invite um so thank you very much everyone um, Thanks very much. Thank really you. grateful for you all. Um, thank you. Great, very enjoyable. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. See you soon. Bye bye. Bye. Take care. Bye now. Bye. <coughs>